today as we come to the table. John is saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But right now at this moment, God is also saying once again through John on this paper, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In other words, the language is saying, even as John presented Jesus as the Savior of the world 2,000 years ago on that riverbank, he's presenting Jesus to you right now 2,000 years later here in this auditorium. Isn't that cool? You have the same Jesus being presented to you. And it's more than just something you're reading. God wrote in such a way that we would know in the language. He's saying it right now again. He wants you to know Jesus is your Savior. He died for you. The good news of Jesus in the Gospels is the one that John the Baptist boldly declared to the people of Israel. His message was simple. Repent or turn from your sins and live your life for Christ. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. Now, John the Baptist gave all the glory to God as the source of his strength and the hope that he had. Pastor Mark will share the same message today and remind you that it's the one you need to tell others too, because God wants you to declare Him and His salvation to everyone around you. Are you so confident in your faith and bold in your standing up for God in front of others that you could go out and talk to everyone you can about Him? The challenging question to consider for sure as we join Pastor Mark now in the book of John chapter 1 to begin his message entitled, Behold the Lamb. John chapter 1, as we continue through the book of John, and we're actually going to be going uh, verse 29 through 42 today, but I want to read just a few of them here at the beginning to kind of lay the foundation and get started, and then we will pray and, and get into the Word. John chapter 1, verse 29. Notice it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him, and I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I've seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Now today, again, as we get into John the Baptist, we're going to come to the place where John finally gets the opportunity to point out Jesus and say, here he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now remember, what we've been covering up to this point is John basically making the announcement that he's coming. The Messiah is on the way. The Messiah is going to be here soon, but the Messiah had not yet shown up. This today will be the day where John gets to say, there he is, the Lamb of God. I'm pointing to him. You can see who he is. Now follow him. And so this is John's moment. John was there to prepare the way, if you will, which was also his moment, but it was to culminate in the fact of him pointing all eyes to Jesus, which is really what God calls us to do. And we'll talk about that more as we get into it. Now, again, as we talk about the Lamb of God, it's not easy for us to understand what this would have meant to the hearers in that day. John points to a man and says, the Lamb of God? Listen, the Lambs of God in that day were sacrificed. They were sacrificial. And I don't think they really understood what John was saying. As a matter of fact, even Jesus' disciples didn't fully understand that the Lord was talking about he had to go to the cross and die until right as he went to the cross to die. They didn't understand it even to the point he was being beaten and nailed on the cross. So they didn't grasp this. But what John is saying is, even as the lambs of God are sacrificed for our sins on that temple mount, this lamb of God will be sacrificed for you. And I don't know that John even fully understood it. John was proclaiming this as a prophet. But later on, John sent his disciples to Jesus, some friends, and said, ask, are you the one? Or are we looking for another one? 
So even though John was being used and he was proclaiming the Lamb of God, I don't think he fully understood what this meant and that the Lamb of God would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. So understand this would have been a very strange thing for the people to hear. But again, it was something that they needed to hear and to understand and begin to recognize who the Lord was. Now, why the animal sacrifices? Again, this is something God had established because sin could only be taken away by Jesus on the cross. Well, what does that mean? That means that everybody that died before the cross, their sins were not really totally taken away. They were temporarily covered. And they were temporarily covered by the blood of all these animals that they were killing on the Temple Mount. That's all that atonement was. It was a temporary covering for all the sins of David and Elijah and all the Old Testament saints. But had Jesus not come and died on the cross, none of them could have gotten to go to heaven because their sins would not have been washed away. They would have just been covered but not washed away. And they have to be completely removed before any man can enter into heaven. Then when Jesus died, all the Old Testament saints, all their sins were totally washed away and forgiven, no longer just covered, now gone. And now our sins are taken away the moment we give our life to Christ because he died on the cross. So understand this is a pivotal moment in world history, not just in the fact of our Messiah coming, but the removal of sin from eternity, if you will. And of course, again, for them to hear that he's the Lamb of God, that wouldn't have been shocking to talk about a sacrifice. But even for them, it would have been shocking to call Jesus the Lamb of God. Because if they begin to even partially grasp it, that would mean one that's going to be sacrificed. And God forbid human sacrifice, except for one. And that is 2,000 years ago. He not only allowed it, he caused it to happen, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on that cross. That's the only human sacrifice he's ever ordained and ever approved of, and that's why he didn't let Abraham sacrifice Isaac on the Temple Mount, because Jesus was the one who would be doing the dying for our sins. So John now shows up, and John now gives the message, and let's jump right back into it. Notice verse 29 of chapter 1. It says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, which means look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, it's interesting here, the words saw and said, when he says, when he saw him, John said, these are in the language or what are called historical presence. And what does that mean? Not presence as in Merry Christmas or Happy Birthday, but present time. And what it means is this is an event that happened historically 2,000 years ago. As a matter of fact, as he wrote it down, it would have already been historic, even if it was the next day or the moment after. But it's written as though it's happening right now. I love that about the Greek language. It's got so many cool things about it that God can express what he's trying to say to us in a way that other languages can't do it. The English language doesn't have a historical present. And so what that means is it's as though it is still happening right now. John is saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But right now at this moment, God is also saying once again through John on this paper, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In other words, the language is saying, even as John presented Jesus as the Savior of the world 2,000 years ago on that riverbank, he's presenting Jesus to you right now 2,000 years later here in this auditorium. Isn't that cool? You have the same Jesus being presented to you. And it's more than just something you're reading. God wrote in such a way that we would know in the language. He's saying it right now again. He wants you to know Jesus is your Savior. He died for you. And if you'll believe in him and give your life to him, you can be saved. Now, again, to most of us, we know what it means to have a Savior. Uh, but what would it have meant to the Jews in John's day to have a Savior that you were calling the Lamb of God? Again, with the Lamb being sacrificed on the Temple Mount, this would have been a whole different viewpoint. Again, they saw him as the Savior of the world taking everything over, not one that came to die. And again, I don't think John even fully understand that he was coming to die. Certainly his disciples didn't until the very end. But the bottom line is, is God is presenting him to them as the lamb that would die in the future. He's presenting him to you this morning, historical present, as the one who died in the past. And the bottom line is, if you believe in him, no matter where you are in history, you will be saved. So the Old Testament saints and us as well. And it's interesting here because it says, um, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's the word cosmos, and it means everything in it. It means every person ever born, every person ever created, every person that ever will be created, things have been put out of order and brought back into order by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And again, the word chaos, it means to make order out of chaos is what cosmos means. And it's that picture of, of it including everything, but also bringing it back to proper order. So Jesus on the cross brought us back to him through his blood, taking sins away and bringing the universe back to proper order. Now, I also find it interesting that cosmos is where you ladies get the word cosmetics. And I find it interesting with that definition, uh, making order out of chaos. I find that interesting. <laughs> I couldn't resist that one, sorry. 
But John says in verse 30, look, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. And remember, we talked about John saying Jesus is eternal. He was before him. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remaining upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the son of God. Now I covered all those verses because there's a lot of stuff to cover, but it all flows better in reading those verses first. But notice what John said. The first thing I want to point out there is in verse 31. What does it mean? John said, I did not know him. John was his cousin. They were cousins. How could John not know him? This was a very family-oriented culture. You know, one of the things that with Maladin Trace, we, I talked about with them, I love the family culture that they have in the Middle East. They have a lot more fellowship and just being together and spending time together. We could use a lot more of that as Americans, could we not? Because what are we like? We're this fast paced, go, go, go. Don't have time to do anything. And yet there's this sweetness to slowing down enough to really get to know each other and to love each other. And I'm one of the guiltiest. And I know that. It's how I was raised. It's how I grew up in America. But I can see it, you know, when it's done the right way. And when I go, you know what, this is good. And there has to be a balance in everything. But my point is the fact that they're so family oriented, there's no doubt they had met. They knew each other. And John says, I didn't know him. What John means is I did not know he was the Messiah until God revealed it. When I saw the Holy Spirit descend from heaven like a dove upon him, I knew that he was the Messiah. But remember, they met, even Mary and Elizabeth met, their mothers met when they were still in the womb. I, here they are standing at the riverbank, I love it, and Jesus and John, they're together, and he's baptizing Jesus, and he sees the Spirit descending like a dove, and it's the first time he really recognizes who Jesus is, and it takes us back to their very first meeting. Do you remember where that was? Mary decided to go visit Elizabeth because she was told Elizabeth was pregnant and Mary was pregnant. And again, Elizabeth was six months ahead of her with John. Mary was six months behind. And it says, when Mary walked in the door, get this, John leaped in the womb. He leaped in the womb. And the first time he was around Jesus, he leapt. And then when he's around Jesus here again, this time he leaps and says, behold, the Lamb of God. And again, I find this so neat because the first time they met, they were in water. And then the first time Jesus was revealed to John as to who he was, they're in water again. Isn't that something? And you wonder, I mean, I know that John couldn't do anything, but you wonder when he walked in the door if that little baby didn't go, you know? I'm sure he didn't do that, but John somehow in the spirit, in the spirit, he recognized this is the Savior. This is why I'm here. I live to proclaim his name. I live to exalt him. Wow, what a great call that is for us, to live to proclaim his name, to live to exalt him. And now John gets to do it again. And John was already exalting him, not knowing who he was, lifting up his name. And now he realizes who he is when he sees the Holy Spirit descending. And as soon as John emphasizes in this, he says, I baptize with water. But he's coming to baptize with the Holy Spirit. There's a real contrast that John was making. The word water is in the emphatic, again, in the Greek. If the Greek could have words that were in a different color, that would be a word that would be in a different color for you in your Bible. Because John is making a point. Hey, I come to baptize in water. It means he stressed it. He made a point. This is water baptism. That's all it is. It's a baptism for forgiveness, for repentance, to repent before the Lord. He said, but one's coming after me that's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's different. That's power from heaven. That's power from God. And when that comes upon you, you will receive power. I love this about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I know a lot of people get kind of funny around that term. Listen, the Bible's the one that calls it that. John the Baptist said he's coming to baptize with the Holy Spirit. It's not something that some religious group made up. It's not something that some hysterical organization started doing. Now, I know it's used that way sometimes, and that's too bad. But the bottom line is, is that this is something that the Bible not only teaches, but here's what I love about this. It is a baptism that Jesus holds exclusively as his own to give. It doesn't even say the Holy Spirit baptizes. Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. He's the one that does it. And why is that sweet to me? Look, your pastor may have baptized you, your dad, your friend, whoever may have baptized you. But the bottom line is, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized in the Spirit, that is God's power has come upon you for ministry, Jesus is the one who did that. He himself did that. He decided to come. You said, Lord, I want to be baptized in your spirit. I need your power. And that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for, by the way. It's not for salvation. When you give your life to the Lord, the Bible says the spirit indwells you. That comes out of Romans and many other places in scripture. The moment you receive Christ, you're indwelt. He lives in you. But there's a separate event. We see a separate work of the Holy Spirit. We see all through the Old Testament and the New. 
In the Old Testament, you see the Spirit came upon the prophet. The Spirit came upon the king. In the New Testament, the Spirit came upon the disciples. The Spirit came upon those in the upper room. It's a different work of the Holy Spirit. It is not a salvation work. It is a work for power. And it is so we will be bold, not only able to walk with God the way he asks us to walk, we'll have the power to do that, but we'll be bold to share our faith. John was bold because he was filled with the Spirit. And now he sees the Spirit coming upon Jesus. God baptized Jesus in the Holy Spirit so that he would have the power he needed as a man on the earth. And if Jesus needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need it? If he himself needed it, we certainly do. And so this is something where, again, we see John basically stressing the difference, saying, you know what? This is something I'm doing in water, but you've got to understand there's a spiritual event that's going to take place for all who believe in Jesus and simply ask him for it. And by the way, that's all you have to do is believe it in your heart and say, God, baptize me in your spirit. I need your power, and he will come upon you with power. It's interesting, the Bible even says that when you are baptized in that power, that you use that power doing ministry, and you need to be filled again. Ephesians 5.18, now you're not going to see this in the English language, but in the Greek, here's what it literally says in Ephesians 5.18. You can jot the verse down and read it later if you'd like. It says, be continually being filled with the Spirit. That's the actual literal Greek. Being continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That means we need a regular filling of the Holy Spirit. You know, I can tell you that after I do first service, I pray again, God fill me again because I give out. And I say, God, fill me again so that I have something to give out second service. doesn't mean I wouldn't be able to stand up here and teach the word, but I need that power. Do we see that in scripture anywhere? Remember when Jesus was walking through the crowds and it says they were all pressing against him. (laughs) Everybody's mashing Jesus in as he's walking through the crowd. And this woman comes from behind and needs a healing and she grabs the hem of his garment. And Jesus stops and goes, who touched me? And the disciples like, Lord, like who didn't touch you would be a better question. Everybody's bumping into you all over the place. He goes, no, no, I felt power go out of me. What happens when you're filled with the Spirit as you're doing ministry, you use that power that God has distributed, but you need to be filled again. That's why in Ephesians we're commanded to be filled continually on a regular basis. You're baptized initially, and then you ask to be filled on a regular basis. Some of you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit today for the first time. Some of you need to be filled again with the Spirit, and we're going to pray for that before we're done. Now, don't panic. Because nothing weird is going to happen. This is what really upsets me. I see a lot of people that abuse these things and they make Christianity look foolish. Let me ask you a question. When John said he saw the Spirit descending on Jesus, how did the Spirit descend on him? Like a dove. Doves are gentle. And yet it's interesting, the power of the universe was in that move of the Holy Spirit. It was something very gentle that Jesus invited. And the Bible says that when that happens, you have control of yourself. You don't lose control. You don't just start running around and doing things. It doesn't say that the Spirit descended like a pterodactyl. And sometimes when you watch these TV events or these whatever events, it looks like pterodactyls should be carrying these people away. I mean, I, it just it's, it gets out of hand. No, when the Spirit comes, He's very gentle. He's a gentleman, but He has all the power of the universe coursing through His very being. And He says, I will give you the power you need to walk with me and to do what I've called you to do. Do you want that power or not? He said, there's one coming after me. This is just water I'm doing. He's going to baptize you with the power and the Holy Spirit. And so John bore witness of him. And again, that's what God calls us to do, to bear witness of him and to be that testimony to the Lord as we're bearing witness of him. And then it's interesting again, notice here he says uh, in verse 34, it says, and I have seen these things and testified to this, that he is the son of God. And so John now recognizing who he is, what he's doing and what he's going to do. And John realizes his call is now coming to a close. John's ministry is now closing down. We're going to see later on, John says in another gospel, I must decrease, he must increase. And so John is simply passing the baton, and we're going to see that passing of the baton right here in these next few verses. Look at uh, verse 35, and again, this is when Jesus gets his first disciples. It says, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Again, every time John saw him, he couldn't help but proclaim it. Got to love that guy. Behold the Lamb of God. There he is again, guys. There's the Lamb of God. This is John saying, follow him, follow him, follow him. Don't follow me. I must decrease. He's the Lamb that you're to follow. And notice it says that John was standing still, but Jesus was walking. And again, I know that might seem like a minor thing, but I think the Holy Spirit worded it that way to let us know that John's ministry was coming to a close. He was now passing the baton to the one that was moving on and carrying it farther. And so Jesus now would be taking this on, and he would be starting his ministry Uh, at the age of somewhere right around 30 years old, which is amazing to me that John no doubt knew him as a person, but even at this point, up to 30-some years old or 30 years old, John didn't recognize who he was, and no one else did either. And then certainly they knew that Jesus was a good man. 
But he hadn't done any miracles yet. No one recognized his power as to who he was, but it's still just amazing. How could you be around someone that was so wonderful as Jesus and not recognize who he is and what he's doing? But again, he announces him as the Lamb of God. And notice, and two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Now, I don't know if any others followed or not at this point. It only says that two of them did. And if that's really the case and no others followed, again, I can't be sure of that without seeing that scene, But remember, there were multitudes of people at the riverbank. And John now points and goes, here he is, the one I've been talking about all this time, follow him. And as Jesus walks on, only two of his disciples begin to follow. How sad is that? And yet, is that not exactly like it is today? If you do some kind of outdoor event or some kind of evangelistic event, now again, you see a lot of people come forward, but you see the majority of the people don't come forward. Even today, if we were to give an invitation to receive the Lord, now I don't know how many people in here don't know the Lord today. There's bound to be some, but we give that opportunity to receive Christ. There might be one or two that do it. There might be none that do it, but it's the same. Our job is simply to proclaim Jesus. And as we proclaim him, we let the Holy Spirit do the work. There are only two here uh, that we see following him. But again, there were disciples that were with John and now leaving John as they move on to follow Jesus. And notice what happens here. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following said to them, I love this, what do you seek? Not who. What do you seek? And they said in Rabbi, which is to say, when translated teacher, where are you staying? Good answer. What do I mean by that? Jesus was probing their heart. Jesus was asking them a very probing question. Jesus didn't say, who are you seeking? As if to give them an out. Oh, we're seeking you, Lord. He got down to the nitty gritty. What is it that you want? In other words, are you seeking my hand or my face? Are you seeking what I can do for you because you have something you need me to do? Or are you seeking me because you want to know me? And that's the same thing the Lord would say to everyone that's in this room today. Why are we seeking the Lord? Why did you come to church today? Did you come to church today because your marriage is falling apart and you want to seek God to help it? That's a good reason. There's nothing wrong in that. He wants to help your marriage. I'm just asking the question. Did you come this morning because you need to pay your bills and there's not quite enough money? There's nothing wrong in asking God to help you with that. Did you come this morning for some other issue or problem in your life? Note this, there's nothing wrong in any of that. God wants to meet your needs. He wants to save your marriage. He wants to help you pay your bills. But he has another question. Why are you seeking me? Is it just so your bills are paid? Is it just so that your marriage is restored? Or do you love me? Do you want me? Do you care about me? See, Jesus is in love with you guys. That's what the Bible says. Get this, imagine this. You might say, well, I I hear that. I've heard pastors say that, but I really don't know that he really is in love with us. I mean, look at us and we're sinners and he's got so much glory. Why would he be in love with us? The Bible says you are his inheritance. Now, if your father was the God of all the universe and your father said to you, what inheritance would you like? I don't think I'd be asking for Mark. I can think of a lot of things I could be asking for. And if the Bible says Jesus said, no, that's my bride. I want that, the church. I want them to be mine. That's my inheritance. That's my reward. That's what I'm after. So he is after you. And he wants to know, why are you after him? And he can have anything you wanted. Listen, if you could have any other religion you wanted, would you still want Jesus? There's the question. Do we love him? Why are we seeking him? Why are we here? What is our motive? So again, if there's something going on where you need his help, there's nothing wrong in that. But I think we do need to check our motives. And Jesus wanted to know their motive. And I think Jesus wants to know our motive as well. You know, Paul said this. Paul said, I count everything as dung compared to knowing the Lord. That's where our heart needs to be. Mary and Martha, remember Martha was serving vigorously around the house and here's Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, these two sisters. Martha comes out and she fusses at Jesus. Make her help me clean this house. Come on, Jesus. And he said, whoa, whoa, Martha, calm down. Mary's doing the best thing of the two. Serving is good, it's commendable, but it's much better to sit at my feet and spend time with me. Get to know me, I love you. Let's grow in our love relationship. The Gospel of John is home to one of the most well-known verses ever, John 3.16. It gives you the message of hope right there in one sentence. God sent His Son to save the world. But the next verse, verse 17, is also significant. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Pastor Mark has something to say about this, too. Yes, Greg, I think you need to know that your life isn't a surprise to Jesus. Maybe you've been feeling like you're too far down the wrong path to turn around, or maybe you're afraid God's going to punish you for all you've done. That verse is there to give you hope. God didn't send Jesus to condemn you. In fact, Jesus' death on the cross forgives all your mistakes and failures. He's enough. 
and all you need to do is come to Him and hand over your sin. Would you like to talk to someone about this? Please call us. We'd love to hear from you. Our number is 865-609-1385 or reach out to us through the About Us section on PastorMarkKirk.com. Never forget that His mercies are new every morning and I'm excited you're ready to start a new life today and know that I'm praying for you. Thanks, Pastor Mark. And with that, we're out of time. But Pastor Mark has more verses to share with us from the book of John. So make sure to join us the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.